the door and the key, the key to the door. You know, um, the alphabetical letter in the Hebrew alphabet, D, the Luth, means uh, you know, every letter in the Hebrew line, uh, alphabet has a, a meaning all in its own. That meaning is door. And uh, it, the door amplifies the fact that God wants to open the door of your mind whereby you can understand his truth and the simplicity in which he taught it. Not making it complicated and not letting, not letting traditions of men cloud the water or stir the mud, whereby you can't see clearly what it is your father would have you know. So he uses the terminology, the door, for many reasons. Let's go to Colossians chapter 4 to begin with, if we may. And let's see what it is perhaps you're to pray for. Okay. Colossians chapter 4, verse 1, and it reads, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Always be fair. Okay. It, it, it doesn't matter. You know, if, if God has given you a successful business, then... It's your employees that make your living for you, so treat them accordingly. It's they that pay the bills. They're, they're, you know, a, a, a worker makes you a profit, and that's why you have one. Appreciate them, all right? For, as he stated, you have a master in heaven, and he cares. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Be thankful for what you do have that is right, Okay? So many people fail to do that. You just take it for granted. You don't want to do that. You want to be thankful for it. If nothing else, be thankful for the very air you breathe. You know, it's, it's yours. The Father created it. And this beautiful earth, and man kind of continues to mess it up a little bit, but the beauty still comes forth. Verse 3, listen carefully. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I also am in bounds. Meaning, I, I, I'm locked up, I'm in jail, because I was teaching the truth, the true Word of God. The true Word of God is not really accepted all that well in this old world, but that's okay. Uh, you make your own way, and you follow the way that Christ made for you, and you won't have any trouble. But I want you to know that it's stated, pray that God will open the door. You've got to talk to him. When you don't understand something, pray about it is to say, Father, I, I need help. And many times he'll just, bam, give you a whole paragraph in one thought of clarity. And understanding. That's no accident. That's your asking him to open that door so that you can go through, so that you can pick up, so that you can understand. And especially of all things, the mystery of God. Well, what is that mystery? Well, we're going to talk about it before we finish this lecture. Verse 4. That I may make a manifest, that I might make it manifest, that I can make it known as I ought to speak, that I can speak what it is the Father would have me say. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Be respectful to them, and with dignity teach that word of God. Verse 6, let your speech, let your message, be a way always with grace, that's love, seasoned with salt. Don't... don't uh, don't soothe talk to soothers until you amount to nothing. You're just lukewarm. You've got to be a little salty. That pays dividends. That you may know how you ought to answer every man. And so it is. So pray for those things. Pray for that knowledge. Pray for that door to open. The door of your mind to seeing and hearing truth. I like to think also of another Hebrew letter, Ayan, which is the equivalent of our O, right, as far as shape is concerned. But it stands for the eye. And the eye mirrors the soul. 
you know. In, in, uh, and when, when the eye can, oh, when you can open your spiritual eye and see through that door of truth to understand that mystery of God, what is that mystery? It's the simplicity in which God taught that you should take care of your people and yourself and be aware of the controversy which is none other than Satan himself and his children. That you're, And he tells us in the Word, when you see through that door exactly how it's going down, it's like reading tomorrow's newspaper. So you don't have to be confused. And you're forewarned, you're forearmed, and, and you're ready. Okay? Now, let, let's go if we made a second Corinthians. Second, second Corinthians, we want to go to chapter two. I want to pick it up with verse 5, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. In other words, Paul had written a letter in 1 Corinthians, and there was an old boy, there was an incestuous affair going on there. But this is also, it's believed by certain scholars that this is something somebody said against Paul. He says, I've already forgiven you all are too, too. I'm, I'm a big man. I can toe up right to it, and I, I can cut it. I can handle it. So don't, don't overcorrect when the correction is made. Don't be like a bunch of chickens chasing a, a bleeding bird, okay? Be decent. S- sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. There, there was a lot of you got on his case. He's learned his lesson. He's been corrected. So that contrary-wise, you ought rather to forgive him. This is a hard thing, okay? And comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. In other words, what is sufficient is sufficient. When, when discipline has been handed out, that's discipline... You know, contrary to what many think, discipline is handed out in love, okay? Because you love somebody and you want them corrected, and you want it, you want it to be in a way, but you don't want to over-discipline. You want to, and, and when you discipline, you do it in love, okay? Verse 8, Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. Let him know that he's forgiven now. Forgiveness is the beauty of Christianity, okay? Because every one of us has been there at one time or the other. You needed forgiveness for something, okay? And you asked the Father for it or someone for it. And and uh, when it is given, that's the beauty of Christianity is forgiveness. For our Father then will forgive us. For to this end, it was for this reason... Also, did I write that I might know the proof? I, I, I wanted to uh, of you. I wanted to test you, whether you be obedient in all things, whether you could cut it. You're supposed to be elders in the church there. I want to know if you can do it fairly, and if you've got the stuff to carry it off. Verse ten: To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. I don't hold it against them. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, or because of the love of Christ, I can forgive that that um, came against uh, me. Verse uh, 11, lest Satan, if you don't do that, what happens? Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan likes for you not to forgive, but to let it fester. Some little thing that doesn't amount to a hill of beans, just build up like a boil, okay? Really make something out of something that, that shouldn't, shouldn't, should have been done away with to start with. And if you don't forgive, and if you don't put it away, sooner the better, and get back on good standings, 
A couple that argue should never go to sleep at night without having forgiven them each other for everything, get a good nice rest, okay? Don't let stuff fester or carry over. Verse 12, furthermore, when I came to Taurus to preach Christ's gospel, and a door, there's that word again, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. I want you to note who it is that opened that door. I want you to know that he will do that for you today. And I want you to know when he opens one, walk on through. Be prepared and walk on through. There are many things for God's elect that are not, I'm repeating myself, but it's no accident. It isn't just happening. Our Father's in charge. He's in control. And if he wants you in a certain place at a certain time, you're going to be there, okay? And you might wake up and wonder, well, what am I doing here? Well, he, he knows. And, but that, that doesn't release you from using this gray matter up here. You're supposed to as best you can. Thirteen, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on thence into Macedonia. Okay, and there, there we have that. Fourteen. Now, thanks be to God, unto all, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge. Of his knowledge. That's to say, it, it's, it, the odor is good by us in every place, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. You got that? Both. Why? To the one... We are the savor of death unto death, that's to say doom, and to the other, the savor of life unto life, and who is sufficient of these things. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but ask of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. In other words, taking God's word and using it as a tool to alleviate anxieties in people's lives, to teach them how to keep Satan away from the doorstep, to know how to anoint their home with the oil of our people, which that's what Christ means, the anointed one. And unfortunately, many Christians are ignorant of that fact and do not anoint their homes or their people in sickness. That's what he instructed. And if you want to be disciplined in him, then that's what, it's, that's what is required. But our Father opens doors. He does it. But you've got to ask. Okay. You have to, this is why God would say in the great book of Isaiah, hey, remind me of all the promises I've made to you. I think it's chapter 43, verse 26. Remind me and let's talk about it. Okay. But He wants you to pick up on it. He wants you to claim it. Because it documents that you've studied His Word to the point that he feels you're worthy, that he can use you. Okay. Let's go now, if we may, to Luke chapter 13. Gospel of Luke, verse 13. Twenty-fourth verse. Let's pick it up there, if we may. Luke chapter 13 Verse 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate. That, that's the door, okay? For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. They're not going to cut it. And you know, it's real sad because all they have to do is be honest with the Father. Just be honest. That's all it takes. When once the master of the house has risen up and has shut the door, he can do it, okay? There can be a door shut right in your face, okay, if you're not careful. Have shut the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not what you are. You've got to make careful you know who you're studying with, friend. There's a lot of people on that day that are not taught that the false Christ comes first. And they're going to be led down Primrose Lane. And Christ is going to have nothing to do with them. Not 
one thing, not until during the millennium. Then shall you begin to say, oh, We have eaten and, and drunken thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. We, we've studied with you. And probably they would even say, We've even called ourselves Christians. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. That's why it's important that you want to latch in to the simplicity in which Christ teaches, and not a bunch of one-verse revolving webs who add traditions onto the Word that are nonsense, not effective. It wouldn't be so um, important if it wasn't your soul we're dealing with. What's important is what God has to say, not some man, not this man or any other man. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourself thrust out. There's a time element there. Do you catch it? That means after the seventh trump is sounded and we're together with those of old. And some are still on that other side of that gulf, that great gulf spoken of in the 16th chapter of this great book. And they shall come forth from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. That's to say, those that believe. And behold, there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. In other words, the, la the first that stood against the Antichrist in the first earth age, which is to say Satan, at the Catabo, the overthrow, then they are last in the generation to stand against the false Christ when he tries to deceive our people. And you're supposed to be delivered up. You're supposed to know the mystery of God whereby he can use you. How fantastic it is that those doors are open and closed. But do you understand what all the only thing they would have to have done? is to honestly pray and ask the Father for truth, for vision to see, to open their eyes, to open the door to tr of their minds to the simplicity of his teachings, whereby man couldn't deceive them. This is the first thing that Jesus warned about in Mark 13 when he said, what's going to happen to you in the end times? He said, the very first warning was, See, that man does not deceive you, for many shall come in my name. What does that mean? Many are going to come claiming to be Christian, claiming to be Christian preachers. But do you know how you tell the difference? Those that claim to be never quite get around to teaching the Word. They'd rather tell you about Aunt Hattie and all her problems and how she overcame it, or something of that nature rather than what God advises. That's why God tests some to see if you've got it or not. Or if you listen to traditions that make void the Word of God. Okay. Let's go, if we may, to Matthew 25. You're all familiar with this uh, particular setting. Matthew 25 naturally comes after the great cha 24th chapter when all seven trumps are given to explain to you by Christ in detail and what you should do to not be deceived. And thus, this follows that. Matthew 25. You want to watch the doors, my friend. Watch the doors very carefully. You're all familiar with the ten virgins. Do you know what the ten virgins mean? They stayed true right up to the last minute. I mean, right up to the seventh trump. Let's see if we can understand what happened. Chapter 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. What is this about the kingdom of heaven? Well, it's a wedding that's going to take place. You're all familiar with it. Two. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Okay. Pretty good average. Verse 3. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. 
Now, let me ask you a question. If you're a thinking person, what good is a lamp if you don't have any oil? I mean, you're, you're, not, you're not going to shed any light, and Christ is that light. You're supposed to be a light giver. But the important thing is, what is that word oil in the Greek? It's el uh, Those are the sacred names of Almighty God. It's olive. Okay. Olive, and that's why he insists that you anoint with it. Okay. Verse 4. But the wise took oil in their vessel with their lamps. They had plenty. Okay. They were prepared. This is truth that you're prepared with in your mind whereby you can withstand the test. While the bridegroom tarried, they were all slumbered and slept. It, it ain't going to happen. It just goes on from day to day, and it'll never happen. You better stand by, friend, because you're in the final generation. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Seven. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Um, many of you didn't live back when we used lamps. When you trim the wick, it burns a lot brighter. Okay. Eight. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. <laughs> they were never lit. Okay. They had no oil. Don't let them kid you. Okay. Verse nine. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Well, that's the wrong place to get the oil that's necessary to light the light of God. Okay. You can't buy it. It's yours for the taking. It's in his word. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in went with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. There comes a time when it's just one day too late, my friend, and that's what happened to these. You want to have that oil in your lamp, and it is the truth of Almighty God disciplining yourselves in His Word, in the simplicity in which He taught. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Thirteen, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. You want to remember this, that Christ gave ever so many warnings about this, that the false Christ comes first. He made it so simple in the book of Revelation, that he said, look, the false one comes with the sixth trump. I'm not coming back till the seventh. And he's going to be, he's going to claim to be Christ. And a lot of you are going to hop in the sack with him. A lot of you are going to be deceived by him. You're going to think he is Christ because he can snap his fingers and lightning comes down from heaven. In Revelation 13 verses 12 through 14 document that. That's very impressive to people, the eyes of people in this world today, uneducated in the Word of God. They're not going to be equipped for that. And they're going to follow Him to their chagrin. Then, inasmuch as Christ is expecting a spiritual virgin, do you think He's going to have anything to do with them? That's why He's going to... You know, Christ doesn't refuse somebody that really has earnestly studied and sought. But if they've been with the Antichrist, he's jealous. I mean, he, he, he expects spiritually a virgin, that is to say, one not beguiled by Satan. Uh, you can find a very clear pattern of that in Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. I expect, Paul says, I expect to present you to Christ as a chaste virgin, not as Eve who was beguiled, expatio in the Greek, wholly seduced by the devil. So, you know, this is a time when that mystery pops forth. And these ten virgins kind of show you the mystery of God. You must have the truth. It's not a big complicated thing. 
is simply shucking the traditions of man and sticking to the Word of God. As it is written, is how it's going to happen. As it, this is why Jesus, when he was asked a question many times, he would say, haven't you read? You don't have to ask, ask me that question. If you read the Word, you should know, and you should. So that's why alleviating all anxieties in his Word gives you a key that unlocks doors that no man can close and opens doors that no other man possibly can open, lest they be one of God's elect. So it's very important that you know that. I want to go now to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 1. You want to get acquainted with the door. Okay. Christ speaking. Verily, verily, that's truly, truly, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Now, you know what a sheep cot is? That, this was a little, many times a little rock enclosure that the shepherd put his sheep into each night and for safety, okay, from wolves and what have you. But they had to go under the rod, pass under, under the staff, to identify his sheep as they came in. Anybody that tried to crawl up some other way was a fake and not worthy. Do you know what the door was? Verse 2. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Verse 3, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. He doesn't drive them. He doesn't whip them. He leads them. And a real teacher will always do that. That's the way Christ set forward for us. You only want to lead people that want the truth. Okay. You don't want to, you don't want to try to blunge in someone into you're going to understand this. If they, if don't cast your pearls before swine. If people don't want to hear the truth, you don't mess with them. Okay. But when someone wants that truth, you be ready to, to proceed. Okay. This word porter, I told you that, um, uh, that um, door is through all. This porter is through all roofs, which is to say the tender of the door, the doorkeeper. Okay, verse four. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. He doesn't drive them; they follow him, for they know his voice. Do you know this is a fact? You know that sheep get so acquainted with their shepherd, they love them. And, and their voice is soothing. The shepherd's voice is soothing to them. And they will follow. And do you know something? That's the mark of a true teacher also. He doesn't have to put a $5 bill under, each, under a chair to get somebody to come to study God's Word. Okay. I, I've known that to happen, all right? I mean, building crowds. That, that's, that's worthless. You want people that want to learn, that want God's door. Okay. And, um, and knowing again that if, if somebody else spoke to one of those sheep, they would run the other way. Meaning what? You are one of his lambs, a sheep. And if Satan comes along talking in a different tone, you don't go. Okay. You don't have anything to do with him. You go the other way. And that's what this has reference to, and you want to pick up on it. There's four. And when he put us forth his own sheep, oh, that we got that, okay? They follow. They know his voice. Verse five. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, 
for they know not the voice of strangers. And you know not, you know, when you hear false teachings, it just really turns you off, okay? That's, I want you to experience this. When you hear a so-called preacher, and he's preaching falsely, you, you draw away from it. It really, you almost feel like you should get up and say something. You know, if you're in his house, pulpit decorum for, forbids that. Let him rattle on. Okay. But you get it. You know, you know that error when you hear it. And it really kind of makes you back off. You don't listen. You don't log it away up here as you do God's real truth. Verse 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. If you're a sheep herder, if you're not a sheep herder, it might be kind of hard to pick up on that, okay? But um, let's let him explain it. Verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, I am, there's the sacred name, beloved, I am the door of the sheep. You want to know what that door is now? There's the answer to your secret. Christ says, I am the door. He is also the light. He is also the Savior. He is also God with us. There, there is no other door into the sheepfold. There is no other door into the kingdom of heaven other than through Him. And so it is. All they that come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. They, they wouldn't listen. They understood. They knew there was something missing from God's Word, and they knew it from a child, being a child, that there was more to God's Word than they were being taught. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. And here we see that God picks his own. You got that? And he guarantees you find what? Do you know what pasture is? That's food. You're going to find it. What? Food for what? Spiritual food. Clarity in the Word of God. Whereby you're not confused and uh, totally understand. Verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy, because why? He is the destroyer. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I mean to the fullest. You know, that you don't have to wait for this. You can enjoy it today by allowing him go through that door, enter into it, and hold true to it. This doesn't mean... You don't lose your credibility in your community, your neighborhood, or whatever, but this is in your own personal life. When you talk to the Father, you don't even have to say it out loud. He's a mind reader. He knows what you're thinking. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd give us his life for the sheep, and so he did. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. A false teacher, when the false Christ shows up, will not only go astray himself, but he will leave the flock unprotected, or lead them to the false one. He doesn't know any better. And that's real sad, because a child can understand the simplicity of God's Word. A child knows that seven comes after six, meaning the true Christ doesn't show up until the seventh trump. Satan comes in the sixth. It is written, and so it shall be. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep. I know which ones are mine. And am known of mine. They know me. Nobody's going to deceive them. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He did for our shortcomings, whereby we have forgiveness for our sins. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And they shall be one fold and one shepherd. We only have the one shepherd. 
all children are God's children, and he calls them into that truth, into that knowledge, for he is a shepherd of love. You know, a good shepherd always tends to and looks out for food for his livestock. Okay. Just as Christ being the door to that good pasture, in or out, always has that door open to you once you follow him. He won't drive you. He won't force you. But he cuts a nice wake. All you have to do is follow that example. In conclusion... Let us go, if we may, to Revelation chapter 3. Let's find out what this mystery is and simplify it whereby anyone can understand what it is our Father would have us do concerning the door and the door key. We know he's the door, and the key is love for him. Chapter 3, the great book of Revelation What does Revelation mean in any language you want to translate it in? It means to uncover or to make known. There's nothing secret or supposed to be hidden about it, as some teach. That's false teaching. You're very well supposed to, should, and it is necessary that you understand it. Um, Verse 7 of chapter 3. Let's complete the lecture. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, and that Philadelphia is a church of brotherly love. It isn't the name that makes a difference, it's what they were teaching. Listen to it. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. If you have the key to David, that's the true genealogy of, of Christ, you're not going to worship a false one. Okay? Nobody can deceive you or lead you astray from, with false teaching. And, and, um, and with that key, you're the, you, have, you have command. You can open it, what, a truth, a word, in the simplicity in which he teaches. Verse 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. There's that door. Well, who is that door? Christ is that door. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. You weren't pulled off by the false one. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are of Judah, our brother, and are not, but do lie. Behold, they're the Kenites, they're the children of Satan. Okay. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I've loved thee. Why would he do that? Because you're going to be at the feet of Christ. And they're actually worshiping Christ, not you. Okay. Verse 10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, that's this book, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. How how many did it say? All the world. Well, what's this hour of temptation? Well, if you're familiar with Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21, you know it's Antichrist standing in the holy place claiming to be God, tempting the world. The reason we escape the hour of temptation, we don't find Satan tempting. We find him rather to be an abomination as he deceives our people. Therefore, you escape that hour of temptation by having the correct oil in your lamp. That is to say, knowing the truth that you're not sucked in by a bunch of false teachings. When the whole world wonders after him, you're going to make that stand. And he's going to stand with you, as it's written in Mark 13. You're not to premeditate what you'll say, but he will speak through you. Okay? Verse 11, listen carefully. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Don't let somebody rob you. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Do you know what a pillar is, friends? That means you hold it up. 
You help with it. And if, if you were to read the 22nd chapter, 21st chapter of this same book, you would find that the eternal uh, gathering has no temple that the Father and the Son are the temple thereof. And you can better understand that pillar. Okay. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, Yahweh, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name, husband. Okay. How precious it is that our Father teaches us and, and gives us the key to that door. Not only shows us the door, but gives us the key to it, whereby you know how to go in and you know how to come out. You know how to find good pasture. That means good food. That means you're successful in life if you hang to it and do what's right, discipline yourself. Use the gray matter for physical as well as spiritual. But then also you will find that good pasture when you open the book of understanding, and you will be well fed by our Heavenly Father from His Word, which always strengthens, which guides, and which brings blessings. It's much better in these trying times today, which are not all that trying if you be a Christian, because you have the blessings of God. And if you do all you can do and turn that over to Him, He's going to take care of you. You can count on He will open doors that you've never thought of. When you love Him and when you trust Him, let's go to His throne. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Father, for the privilege of serving You. Father, let all these be a blessing to all they come in contact with, Father. Give them that love and that salt, Father. That that salt takes hope and changes the flavor from the bad to the good that they can leave touch and God, we ask it in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen.